science enthusiasts. Welcome to Spaces Unleashed. Every week on Twitter, we bring an expert to chat live through the Spaces program. And this is bonus content that goes with the Science Podcast. We hope you enjoy the show. We have an amazing guest today. It's Dr. Jessica Kanya. And is it okay if we call you Jessica? Oh, yeah, or Dr. yeah, totally. Jessica or you, Dr. you can Kanya? call me Jessica, whatever, whatever you're comfortable with. I like calling you Doc <laughs> because you are a doctor. So <laughs> uh, We have Dr. Jessica, Jessica Kanya, and you were one of the first people that we connected with on Twitter, which is wild. Right. Way back when we started the Bunsen and Beat, way back, yeah. And one of the first guests on the podcast. Yes. The, the oh, my podcast. gosh. I... So I'm trying, I'm, I'm tweeting and talking right now. So I, this is incredible. <laughs> um, yeah. And, and you were actually one of the first people I connected with on Twitter too. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. We go way back like month at least. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so I'll have, to, I'm, I'm going to have to find the episode, but I think Dr. Kanya was like the fourth or fifth episode ever of the science podcast. When I was just trying to figure out how to be a podcast host, he had about 30 listeners, <laughs> um, and you were so gracious to be a guest, and you were such a good guest. Um, oh, I had so much and, fun. Uh, and I think we should have you back on, yeah, we should have you back on the podcast for sure, maybe um, in Oh, I would four. love to. Yes, and if I remember correctly, the title has um, butts in it, so, you know, just again, naturally, I tweeted that we would somehow end up talking about poop in this hour, and... I have foretold it, so <laughs> may it be. <laughs> yeah, well, there's a lot of, like, if anybody know, owns a dog, they know there's a lot of poop that goes <laughs> into that whole business. So, um, well, it depends on the size of your dog. So, um, Dr. Kanya, where, like, how did you get into becoming a vet? Like, what what's your story? Well, um, I mean, I guess it started, you know, I was obsessed with cats, especially when I was a kid. Um, anytime there were kittens anywhere, I would just, I, I mean, I remember just little flea ridden kittens that I would hang out with and um, play with. And, uh, and then I ended up volunteering at a cat shelter when I was uh, like 13, 14 um, and just kind of, you know, stayed there and uh, started working with uh, like the medical team and the in intake team. Um, and I, I wasn't sure for a while if I wanted to be a vet because I was I wasn't sure if I could do like euthanasias or, you know, kind of handle that. Um, <clears throat> but I mean, I just, I really loved, especially at the shelter, just learning about shelter medicine and, and kind of seeing that interface, you know, between the, um, the pets and, and their, their new owners. Um, uh, yeah. And then just after that, I, you know, uh, started undergrad and, and started in a, a pre-vet program. So it had like, uh, we had a lot of classes with uh, the veterinary technician program um, students. And so it was a really good overlap, you know, to have some, some extra skills and not just the science classes. So it, it, were you, was, was science something in school, like high school that you really enjoyed oh, yeah. <laughs> or was it the draw working with animals too, or kind of, a I combo? think it was a combo. Um, I, yeah, I, I loved biology. Um, I have to admit, and I'm so ashamed now, but I hated physics and just a little more than physics. I hated chemistry. And now, I mean, it's completely, <laughs> now it's completely backwards. Now I love chemistry the most, physics second and biology third. <laughs> um, but I mean, I, I feel like I, I didn't have um, a, a lot of good teachers and good mentors in my physics and my um uh, chemistry classes. I feel like my my freshman biology teacher in high school was just so excited about everything. And um, I mean, I just remember, you know, feeling that excitement. I think that, you know, looking back, I didn't even realize it at the time, but, you know, just looking back and, and knowing, you know, he was somebody who genuinely believed in the students and just loved what he did. Um, you know, and, and now that I can apply the, you know, the physics aspect and the chemistry aspect to, to my life and apply it in a fun way, um, you know, I think that that's really changed, changed a lot of things. Yeah, having a good teacher can go a long way. I uh, I hope that my, uh, my, like, my day job will know um, is not being Bunsen and Beaker's dad. I wish that was my day job, but my day job is <laughs> I'm a high school chemistry teacher, so that's chemistry is my my baby but i know they have a teacher 
There's amazing history teachers. I'm sure people who've had an amazing teacher in their life that just we story and you get really wrapped up into what happened hundreds of years ago. Um, but so back to you, uh, Dr. Kania. So you, um, you pursued becoming a vet. Where, where do you, where do you work now? Do you have a, do you have, do you, are a part of a practice? Do you have your own practice? What's what's going on with you as a vet? Yeah, so I'm in private practice right now. Um, and so I mostly see mm -hmm. uh, dogs and cats, um, very, very rarely, you know, the occasional kind of pocket pet, um, hamster or guinea pig. Um, uh, but yeah, and, and just, you know, I mean, I, I'm sure a lot of you know, because a lot of you follow me and, and are pet owners and um, you know, uh, there, there's just been such a shortage of veterinarians and such a, um, <clears throat> such a high demand as well. Um, and so it's, it's been really interesting though, because, you know, we, we've had some of that backlog, um, from like the internists and even the oncologist. I mean, a couple of oncologists are booked out, you know, a month or two months, which is just a sad joke. I mean, um, and, and I mean, just to see, I guess, to see the solidarity between vets, right now, you know, just so willing to just, you know, spend extra time talking to each other, helping each other, um, you know, time that I know that they don't have. And, you know, just, uh, just really smart role models answering my questions. And, um, you know, so I, I feel like it's, you know, I'm, I'm still in general practice. Um, but I feel like it's really amped up in the, the last two years. Is is there have you been busier because of covid like because all these people got covid animals um like beaver's a covid puppy right yeah yeah and, and so um that's that's definitely one factor i think it's the you know the the nuance is that it's kind of multifactorial um you know obviously with covid uh, and then when we with um covid protocols that really just elongates the amount of time that it takes from the beginning of the appointment to the end um and then with uh, um, owners being home more, they're seeing their pets a little bit more, you know, they're noticing uh, here and there behaviors that they might not have seen otherwise if they were gone, you know, for, for part of the day. Um, and then we're also, uh, of course, seeing the, the increased adoptions, which is never a bad thing, and, um, you know, increased puppies in general, which I can't complain about. I mean, I, really, it's not sad to start and end my day with a happy puppy visit. <laughs> um, uh, you know, mm -hmm. and, and then I think, uh, uh, and then uh, of course, another big part of it too is just staffing. Um, right now, there's a, an incredible shortage of veterinarians and um, veterinary para staff workers, uh, and and you know, it's just it's been really really tough to to keep up with the demand. Is that local to your area, Jessica? Like the area, or is that like all over? Um... North America, like I'm in Canada, so I I don't know. Yeah, yeah. So I know that it's it's pretty prevalent. I'd say I'm I'm pretty sure throughout the the entire United States. Um, when I was kind of looking around online for some of the like statistics and um, you know, exact uh, data and everything, um, it sounds like the UK, Australia, uh, you know, have been hit as well, and um, parts of uh, I think parts of Canada, but I can't, I don't quote me on that, um. And I, and I know too, just, you know, hearing anecdotally from friends and, and just people around, you know, this area. And, and I have a couple of friends, you know, Arizona, Alaska, um, a lot of the Pacific Northwest. And, and it's, it's been pretty much the same everywhere, it, it sounds like. Um, and then I know too, kind of bigger issue than, than the crunch in, in small animal uh, and exotic pets is uh, we really don't have any large animal veterinarians. Um, and so, you know, these are the, these are people you probably don't think about a lot. Um, you know, they're, they're the vets that are driving their, their vet truck from farm to farm and, and, you know, they're making sure the cows are healthy. They're, you know, milk is safe. The meat is safe. Um, and, you know, I mean, they, you know, they're, they're vital. Um, so uh, what I, what I understand, at least through the USDA, it sounds like that's an even bigger crisis than the, um, small animal world. And then I, I mean, I can't even imagine it being worse than it is right now not to not to sound doom and gloom and um you know i, I guess i hope too that we can use this this space too to have some i, I know that i follow and, and a lot of those vets follow me um you know i hope that that some of them can you know kind of speak up and, and let us know just as as vets and as lay people you know what we can do to you know to help you hmm. i didn't know i didn't know about that um well uh so I guess just one more follow-up question before we move on is the, 
is the issue getting more people interested in veterinary medicine? So you get like an influx of people that can can help out in the profession? Um, or is it way more complicated than that? Just yeah, to- sadly, it's, it's way more complicated than that. Um, I think one of the great things is a lot of people are, are interested in veterinary medicine and, um, you know, and I mean, and a lot of people are good at veterinary medicine. It's, it's like science, you know, a, a lot of people are afraid to, to try it and, you know, they think they're not going to be good at it. And it's like, no, you're not good at anything the first time you try it. Um, but, you know, a, a lot of the people that we're seeing right now um, are, are people that have only worked in vet med for a few years or, um, you know, are, are new to the field completely. And I mean, it's incredible how fast, you know, people learn uh, just how, how well they learn. And I think too, you know, even on, I say to the team, sometimes even on, on the worst day, you know, I still get to be a vet, which is pretty cool. Um, and, and, you know, I really can't complain about that at the, I find a way, but I really can't complain about that at the end of the day. And um, I mean, I, I think that that's, kind of what, uh, you know, what drives people to the profession. And, and I think, um, you know, so I started to go off on that, but, but no, I, I think that there's, there's a lot of interest in the profession. I think there's a lot of, um, sadly kind of structural gatekeeping, um, in the profession. I mean, it's, uh, the, the AVMA, the American Veterinary Medical Association is quoted in a, I think a 2014 article, uh, stating that we are the whitest profession, um, which is not good. Uh, and so, you know, unfortunately, it, it kind of boils down to the structure of um, agriculture in this com- in, in the United States, in this in this country, um, you know, in general. And I won't get into that entire long history, but, um, you know, so that that's a, a major uh, factor right now as well. And especially in underserved areas for veterinarians. Um, another another issue kind of with that, that gatekeeping thing is um, there's only about 30 vet schools in the country uh, and then they each matriculate. oh yeah that's yeah they, they each matriculate through i mean it's about 130 i think um students each year uh and so you know i mean and and you know the day you graduate uh some people go on to internships or uh, and then residencies um but you know a lot of us just go on straight to general practice and so you know the day you graduate they just <laughs> kind of toss you in the deep end in the nicest way possible um you know but but it still does take some time to really get that confidence and and really um just get your spiels down and, and get your notes down and everything um and and so you know and that's definitely something that it takes a lot of time to to accredit a school um if we're already seeing a shortage of professionals and we're definitely seeing a shortage of specialists that are able to teach at schools and um you know so that's and then i think that the the third factor um is is pay, quite frankly. Um, And I think it actually starts as as terribly as vets are paid. I think it starts at the bottom with the quote unquote, with the para staff, especially with reception and with technicians. Um, And so, I mean, we're seeing, you know, people, um, you know, people who are are trained there under, they understand medicine, they understand how to triage uh, emergency medical cases, cases, you know, they're getting paid 15 bucks an hour. And I mean, it's it's the, the amount of work and the amount of just emotion that you put into the job, and you know, being a receptionist at a veterinary clinic. I mean, you, you're the one that are that's saying no to people on the phone who are crying, who are panicked, who are, you know, you literally have no control over that situation. I mean, I think 90% of clinics, if the doctor says no, you know, the receptionist has to say no. Um, and so even just starting at that role and then moving up, you know, we have our, our veterinary assistants who are the unlicensed um, uh, people in the building. And so uh, they do, you know, uh, a, a well-trained assistant can do pretty pretty well anything, um, you know, blood draws, uh, uh, they know, you know, diagnostic testing, microscope, all that kind of thing. Um, and then we have our veterinary technicians who go through school, um, two year schooling, and then they take a specialized board exam. Um, and they have to do uh, an intern- internship as well. Um, and then they they um, can get their license. And so unfortunately, that doesn't really bump up your pay too much. And um, just the, you know, the the debt to, sorry, my cat just stepped on my phone, <laughs> the, the debt to time ratio. Um, and then the debt to income ratio when they graduate is just becoming just not worth it. You know, at least again, from what I understand from from my friends and, and co-workers. Um, and then the, the, Right. If we don't, uh, if there's not the pay for that job, though, people will find something. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, and, and, and it's, mm-hmm. and that's the thing. I mean, it's an agonizing decision. I, I see, you know, 
I mean, I talk with my friends, I, I've seen people who've left the profession and then, I mean, they're, they cry, you know, it's, it's, it is not an easy decision to make, um, you know, and, 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 you know, and then again, of course, getting, getting up to the veterinarians, um, even there, the debt to income ratio is a major factor right now um, in, in even accessing veterinary school. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's, um, I mean, I honestly think that, that it really kind of boils down to that. I, I mean, I hate to say, you know, it boils down to money, but um, unfortunately, I, I think that it, it's just gotten to a point where, you know, we're in as much debt um, as medical students. You know, I have friends, you know, that graduating, I'd say $200,000 in debt, um, you know, of course, and, and there's definitely a variance for everybody, but, um, and then when you graduate and you're kind of, uh, I was just looking today, the um, AVMA cited that the average salary for a veterinarian is $108,000, which is a lot of money. Let's, you know, say that up front. Um, but when you're looking at your, you know, again, your debt to income ratio, how long it's going to take you not just to finish, obviously, as everybody knows, not just to finish paying off the debt, but the interest as well. Um, you know, and so I, I think a lot of people are, are uh, not not even, uh, they're just actively discouraging, you know, younger um, generation to, to go into the veterinary field. And sadly, I mean, it's, you know, it's not a field you go into to become a millionaire and um, that used to kind of be said tongue in cheek or, or, you know, kind of to be, um, to showcase our empathy. But I think nowadays it's, it's more of a, um, just kind of a sad reality, I guess. And I, I don't know what the, the solution to that is. It's just, you know, I just want to put that out there. I, I, I can pick it apart, but I do not know the solution. <laughs> well, I think just having chats like this and talking, um, is a big solution to the problem. If people don't know there's a problem, you don't know that there's a problem. You can't fix a problem that you don't know there's a problem. So it's like a, it's like a circle of just stupidity. That is very true. That is, I mean, and you know, I got to say, I don't think that anyone's ever said a sentence in the past that is, I'm doing my Twitter space with the science dog, and I mean, I just, you know, I feel like we're making history. Is what I guess I'm trying. <laughs> hey, Jessica, I have a couple questions for you before we open it up to to folks. Um, one one is just a couple couple things that you you're you're you know a lot about, and it's in your profile. And we've talked about it on the on the podcast before. You're a one health advocate. Could you could you talk a little bit about that? I find I find it fascinating. One yeah, health. yeah. So one health is this concept, um, you know that that uh, animal health, human health, and environmental health are you know, inextricably linked. Um, and so I, I think that it sounds pretty simple on, on the surface, you know, somebody says that and you're like, yeah, duh. Um, but then when you really get down to it and start thinking about it, I mean, we're talking on genetic levels. <laughs> I, I mean, uh, again, whenever we think about um, science and I think especially now just with um, all the climate change news, uh, you know, out there and I think it, the information has been more, more accessible than ever. Um, you can really start to see how, tiny little things, you know, as small as carbon molecules are, I'm sorry, car carbon atoms and, uh, you know, carbon dioxide molecules um, are, are changing, you know, our entire weather pattern, changing our, the, the visible world to us. And, um, you know, and so I think that that kind of, uh, you know, kind of drives home the concept. And um, I guess it's kind of a, an example um, that I've been uh, looking at recently, where, uh, just looking at genetics across species. Um, we see the same um, BRCA1 and BRCA2 gene mutations in Siamese cats um, as we do in a lot of uh, breast cancers in women. Um, you know, I mean, I would say probably once every couple of weeks I diagnose a hypothyroid dog, uh, which most commonly is uh, Hashimoto syndrome. Um, it's not called that in veterinary medicine, but um, that's that's the it's the exact same um, uh, lymphocytic uh, infiltration of the thyroid gland. Uh, you know, and so I, I mean, when it really gets down to it, pretty pretty much every little thing you can think of is is you know, that we as humans, any problem that we have that, you know, we're trying to solve is somewhere in nature, somewhere in the animal kingdom, you know, it's, it's out there and, and it's, we are not the first, people, the first ones to, to experience it. And um, I think that when you really start thinking that way, it really opens things up. I mean, and, you know, and again, some of it kind of sounds crazy, but even thinking about, you know, there are some shark species out there that don't even go through puberty until they're 300 years old. I mean, that is impressive. 
And, you know, so we're, we're talking about, you know, even as, as frivolous as like the beauty market or staying young. I mean, hey, let's get those guys in the lab. Let's take a look at these sharks. And um, <laughs> now hold on. Hold on a second, Dr. Kanye. Does that mean you would be in puberty for 300 years? Because that's a deal that would be a deal breaker for me. <laughs> Could you imagine the cracking voice? <laughs> um, no, no, they uh, they don't enter it until until that. Yeah, my voice will be fixed in about 200 more years. Oh, my years. goodness. Like, can you imagine? Actually, and speaking of one help, so my, my cat, Mr. Jim Business, who is currently lounging on my lap, um, many of you or some of you might have seen that he got neutered last week because he was trying to make little inbred babies with his sister. Um, and so I, I made kind of a controversial in the vet world um, decision to uh, wait until six months to neuter him. Um, and the reason for that is because we're, we're seeing a syndrome in cats um, that probably a lot of you are familiar with called fluted. Um, it's an acronym for feline lower urinary tract disease. Um, and so we're seeing, especially in male cats, they're basically getting so stressed um, about several different things that we, for some reason cats are stressed about. Um, and, and they're essentially uh, stressing themselves into getting this, uh, these crystals in their bladder. And so that starts to irritate the bladder wall. Um, the bladder will start to secrete mucus and it'll kind of turn into this like sort of mushy plug and it'll actually, it can get lodged in the urethra. Um, and now it's a surgical emergency. Um, and so um, I, I was looking in, in goats, they have kind of a similar issue at the end of their urethra without getting too into penises on this Twitter space. Um, uh, they, they have a similar <laughs> issue and, and they're predisposed to, to very to the similar stones and, and uh, crystals. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, it's just known in, in large animal medicine that if you castrate a goat um, before puberty, uh, you know, it's going to have a, a smaller urethra diameter. And so um, I found just one tiny study and most studies in vet med are small. I think it was um, 21 cats total. And so, you know, when you account for a control group versus, you know, prepubescent and postpubescent neuter, um, it was about seven per, per each. Um, but they were, they were looking at how easy it was to extrude the penis uh, in these cats that had been um, neutered either before or after puberty. Um, and then ones that had not been neutered at all. Um, and then they, you know, we're, we're basically rating how easy it was to pass the um, the catheter that we have to pass to, to unblock the cat. Um, and so, you know, I mean, I, I think it makes sense in my brain, like, oh, yeah, you have the effect of puberty on the penis, it's going to grow larger. Again, I can't believe I'm talking about this at a Twitter space. How did I get into this corner? Um, but uh, anyways, and so I, you know, just this kind of things like that. Um, I, I think it's just interesting to to look across species and, you know, it's like, oh, I never thought about that, but it makes sense. And, um, you know, and again, I'm not advocating for, for delaying neuter of your cat. I think that there's a lot of different reasons to neuter before, you know, a certain age, before, you know, a certain weight. Um, uh, but, you know, just that, I guess that that's kind of a, and something that's been bopping around my mind. And, you know, I think that in the future, we're going to be seeing probably more research coming out about that. Um, but I mean, really just anything, you know, any problem you can think of, I mean, you, you can find it somewhere else in, in the world. That's interesting. I, on the podcast last week, two weeks ago, um, there was a, it was a letter that somebody had written and I talked about it on the podcast about how, um, cat science is like, there's so little science done on domestic cats compared to dogs, for example, but then you have species to species similarities between us and cats that um might even be greater than between us and dogs like from a disease perspective and that they are trying to make the point that well we need to know more about cats because then we know more about ourselves and that sounds like this is all part of that one health idea oh yeah absolutely um one of the things i don't ah yeah and one of the things that's wild is um like ticks due to climate change right like the ticks that are just all over the place in different places in the world are slowly moving where they've never been before. Yep, correct. Um, and same with heartworm disease, yeah. um, which is carried by mosquitoes. Oh, right. Heartworm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah we're, we're definitely seeing that. And it's tough because, you know, especially people who, who, um, you know, who are older and they've had dogs their whole lives. Um, you know, that's definitely something I hear a lot. Like, yeah, I've had a dog my whole life. I've never had an issue. And it's like, I believe you, <laughs> you know, it really hasn't, we haven't really seen this, um, uh, you know, I mean, I would say probably before I entered school, we weren't really 
concerned about, you know, ticks in, in northern states, you know, in certain states like Wyoming, they weren't really, you know, you didn't really need heartworm uh, preventative. I mean, you know, again, depending on who you asked, I guess, but um, yeah, it, it, I, it's just interesting how, how quickly it's changed, um, you know, looking back. All right. Before I open up the the Florida questions, you talked about your cat. Um, you do you have a, you have another pet, I believe. Don't yes. You? Yeah. It's kind of gotten to to be an interesting zoo here recently. Um. Uh, so my oldest cat is Keely. Uh, she's a, an eight year old little grumpy kitty. Um. I have Spalding, my my dog. Um. And then I have. These... I love Spalding. <laughs> yes. Yes. Has... Uh, Spalding. I love him so much. There's a picture of Spalding in the nest. Everybody. Oh my gosh. Yes. He, uh, oh my goodness. And he, uh, 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 this would just go to his head. I shouldn't tell him. <laughs> no, honestly, I don't think I would have nearly as many followers as I have if I didn't have pictures of Spalding on my Twitter. I'm, I, I'm not deluded by that. <laughs> um, but yeah, and then I have uh, two kittens, uh, uh, right now. And, um, and then I have a hamster, uh, named Scott and two hermit crabs. Uh, so that, and I think that's it. I did see a house centipede in the basement the other day, but we're not friends. Um, so those are all my pets so far. <laughs> hey, everybody. Thanks for listening to our show week after week. If you want to know how to support the science podcast, here are a couple ways. It's always going to be free to download, so you'll never have to worry about paying for it. But, you know, things do cost money running a podcast, and, and here are a couple ways you could help us out. One is join our Patreon page. It's amazing. It's growing. It's almost like an extended family. There's multiple tiers of support, and we have lots of fun perks for being part of our Patreon page. The other way you could support us is giving us an awesome review on Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts, anywhere you can rate our podcast. Give us a great review. The third way you could support the show is checking out the Bunsen Burner BMD.com website. We have awesome merch there. We work really hard finding quality merchandise that's comfortable with vibrant colors. So three ways to support us, the Patreon page. Two, give us a great review. Three, head over to our merch stop and see if there's anything there you'd like. Thanks, everybody. All right. Okay, I'm going to, as as we always do in Twitter spaces, um, we had a really good conversation. So thanks. Thanks, Dr. Kanya. I'm going to open up the Florida questions from the listening audience. So if you'd like to be a speaker, you can um, ask for the mic. I will just, so, so just a heads up. I will double check that you're following us. Um, if it's an account I don't recognize, I kind of creep on you to make sure you're not a troll account or a bot. And and some people aren't super comfortable about um, grabbing the mic, so you can direct message me the question, and I'll try my best to get to it. Um, we've got lots of questions, which is awesome. And just to, if you're just joining, um, Spaces Unleashed, we run this every Tuesday at 7, and our guest today is, doc, is vet Dr. Jessica Konya. Um, Doc, are you okay to take some questions from the Yeah, people? bring it up. Okay. Um, so, I believe Liz was first. Um, actually, Lori was first first. Lori, do you have a question? And then Liz, you're on deck. Lori, you're still up here as a speaker. You just um, have to unmute yourself. Yeah, I, Liz is on deck. I did. I, I just wanted to, to ask about my one-and-a-half-year-old female dog, I rescued her from um, a clinic that had her spayed at eight weeks, which I felt was really young, but I got her. And she has um, incontinence. And I was wondering if being spayed at such a young age would contribute to such a young dog having incontinence. Yeah, so we definitely do see that. Um, you know, certainly we can see, uh, any, any female dog, um, spayed, you know, before her feet, her first over heat cycle, um, we can theoretically see spay incontinence. Um, it's usually something that I don't see until later in life, you know, as the just natural, um, small amount of estrogen that the adrenal glands are producing starts to decline. Um, but yeah, I mean, hearing something like that, I would assume that it's, it's probably related to the, the timing of the spay. Um, and that kind of actually goes, you know, goes back to what I was saying earlier. I think, I think it's tough because each, you know, there's always, there's a good reason I feel like either way, um, again, having worked in shelter medicine, you know, the sad reality is that small ones and small puppies, they are adopted the fastest. Um, and, you know, they bond with their families the best, you know, et cetera. And, um, uh, 
you know, so we, we do want to spay and neuter those animals before we get them out and, and get them into homes. And, um, you know, I feel like I, no matter which way you go, there, there's certainly a trait. Um, and and you know, that's an excellent right. question. Um, you know, it, it definitely, definitely is a relation. I was, I was just wondering if there shouldn't be, I was just wondering if there shouldn't be a minimum age requirement because I've had two shelter pets that were spay at young ages. Both of them had problems and it makes me feel like I should advocate for these animals to not be altered so young. But I get the other side where you don't want to end up with more unwanted, you know, pets. So I know it's it's rough, but how do you feel about a minimum age requirement? Yeah, and I think that's a really good question. I mean, personally, um, I I think that there should be a minimum age. Um, I don't like to spay animals usually before three months. Uh, you know, again, it's it all kind of is dependent on on situation, et cetera. Um, I think there's a lot to be said too about taking you know taking the animal, um, puppy or kitten, from the litter and from the mother. Um, you know, before a certain age. And I know that right now there's a lot of, you know, debate about that. And I, I by no means an expert about that. Um, but, but, you know, debate about delaying, uh, traditionally people will, uh, will send their puppies to their new homes at about eight weeks. Um, and, and I know that there's, you know, evidence with delaying so 12 weeks, uh, you know, improved socialization, et cetera. Um, and so, I mean, I feel like, you know, kind of even tying back to to what was said earlier about how there's just not a lot of information out there about feline medicine, um, and also tying back to One Health, I feel like, um, you know, we're we're going to be looking at, you know, in like ten years we'll be looking back at this and, you know, kind of kind of using the same questions. You know, are we causing psychological harm? Is there, you know, long term um, physical issues that you know, are, um, uh, that we should, you know, not be compromising on. And, um, I think that that's something, you know, we as a society and, and especially shelf, you know, shelter workers and just animal advocates, I know are, um, just so, so dedicated to what they do. And, um, you know, I feel like they, they advance a lot of that kind you know, research or even just advocacy for, you know, data aggregation. Um, and yeah, you know, so, I mean, I guess, I guess what I'm saying is, you know, while, while I personally think that, you know, there's a, a reason for each specific situation. And as a vet, I, I don't spay or neuter under a, a certain age. Um, I think it's important to, you know, that we're just having the conversations in general and, um, you know, and as you said, you know, advocating for it and, and having, having a conversation about it. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I guess it's not an easy answer, but, um, but certainly it, you know, have, having had pets that have these issues um, also really brings it, you know, kind of brings it home. Because as a veterinarian, I see them, but, you know, I don't live with the pet. I don't see it 24-7. And, and really, the, you know, the pet's owner is an expert on that pet. Um, you know, I, I might be an expert on this behind the pet, but, you know, you're the expert on them. And um, I think that kind of knowledge is really invaluable. And especially, you know, among medical professionals, I feel like we sometimes get that blind spot of, you know, what we see in the clinic and on, on the pages versus what the reality is at home. Hmm. That's a great question and a great point, Lori. Um, those of somebody's in the space works at a shelter and they might bring that up because of what you talked about right now, right? We've got, uh, great. 50 Thank odd, you. yeah, we got 50 some people here. Oh, whoop. I muted myself. <laughs> um, when you're not a speaker, please mute yourself. Um, we're going to head over to, uh, Liz and then Kathy and Tracy is on deck. So Liz, go ahead. Hello. Hello. Um, just a comment and then a question. I, I think it's interesting how, I don't want to say interchangeable, but like my dog's got, she's hypo and Cushing's and all that stuff. So we have her on people meds. Like she's on Dan, on Danzatron and Amantadine. And I'm kind of irritated that her thyroid meds are cheaper than mine. And I don't even use insurance with hers. But um, my question, and you please don't feel I'll answer this if it's not anything that you're comfortable talking about, but I'm friends with my vet and we've talked about it before the mental health piece and the astronomically and I will say unnecessary, um, suits among veterinarians. Do you obviously you have an opinion on that? Do you think you might want to help some people understand where that's coming from? Like Chris has talked about, you know, compartmentalizing and just the stress and dealing with just so much emotion 
all the time and you never get to turn off. Yeah, I, I think I, I think that those are, you know, that definitely hit a lot of the high points. Um, you know, I mean, the profession in general, and I don't like to paint with a broad brush because definitely everyone is different, but it attracts people who care deeply and and we we all might care you know care in a different way um outwardly but but i think internally we have very similar you know feelings and and conflict i mean i was i was so surprised when i got into practice uh you know at the very beginning i mean i would the first few nights, like I would just stay up at night thinking, is that ear infection really going to get better? I mean, I would lose sleep over an ear infection. You know, it's, um, it's not that I, I, sh- you know, shouldn't care. And, but I feel like it's a, a tough, um, balance for a lot of us to strike. And I definitely feel like that's something I struggle with is, you know, finding that balance of, you know, how much time do I want to, to dedicate to this when I know that there's really nowhere else right now that the pet owner can reach out to, while I also know that I need to keep myself sane and, you know, work on these others. Um, I mean, and I, I think that <clears throat> a lot of it too is, is I'm kind of learning to prioritize um, myself and, and kind of prioritize, you know, sort of defending, you know, which I don't like use the word defending necessarily. It sounds kind of aggressive, but, you know, I guess defending what, you know, the time that I need to spend on, on each, each task. And um, yeah, I mean, and I, and I feel like it's really, it's difficult for a lot of vets to to say no, you know, it's difficult for a lot of vets to say, you know, like, no, I can't squeeze that one in. Cause you know, when, when you start to think about it, you're going to convince yourself that you can. And I mean, I, I, I tell people sometimes it's like, you know, we could skip lunch and stay late every single day. You know, if we, if we wanted to, we would find a way. Um, and it's, it's just not worth it. You know, we have to, um, I, I think we have to learn to set those boundaries, but I think even bigger, we have to, be like as teams hold each other accountable to those boundaries, you know, not, um, you know, not be like, I'm gonna take a short lunch today. No, you know, you're not. <laughs> um, I mean, and of course there's always going to be a situation, you know, rarely that is going to um, interrupt that. But I mean, I think that we need to be nicer to ourselves and to our colleagues for setting those boundaries. And we need to realize that that's literally killing us. I mean, I literally watched a vet I used to work with die because of that I mean that you can literally care too much and I mean it I I I think that you know even outwardly if a if they you know your vet kind of appears stoic or or, you know like they don't care you know they do and and um yeah I mean I, I guess I don't really know how to how to conclude that um other than i don't mean it all doom and gloom because we care in ways that make us so deeply happy too i mean i have cases that i mean i can cry i'm so happy about you know you see the rechecks and they're doing well and the owners you know glowing and the pet and the owner are just so happy together and um you know and i think that that's also kind of what what makes it rewarding and i think with COVID, especially um not having the face-to-face with the owners um, you know, first of all, puts it on a, on a um, precedent where, you know, the owner of them to trust us because they don't see us or know us, um, but but not even, you know, face to face, um, I feel like uh, put, puts a space there that we didn't realize that we didn't want. Hey, do you guys hear that? The Canada geese are leaving. Coming back to you guys. <laughs> do you guys hear that? There's a giant flock that just flew over our house. Is that a threat? See you later, cobra chickens. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. They're they're gone. <laughs> Must have been about 200 of them. Okay. A 200 goose salute. I didn't I, I didn't mean to break break up that super serious. No, that was actually perfect sorry, timing. God. I was literally just done with my sentence and I was that that's impressive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those they're coming down to you guys. I don't know where. Somewhere's in the United States probably. Um Hey, can I can I just tell you? I've been meaning to tell you this story. Uh, can can I tell you? And then we'll get to Kathy. Oh, Is yeah. that okay for everybody? <laughs> so Bunsen and Beaker needed to get updated on their shots, and uh, we couldn't get them into their our vet. Um, they were all booked up. That's fine. It was kind of short notice. My fault. So we took them to another vet um, uh, clinic that we've been to before, and uh, like we had to wait um, probably an hour and a oh, half. Yes. But I know, but I, I wasn't upset and I want everybody to think about this, this story to 
have grace and to be kind because what was happening at that vet clinic that day was nothing short of like a, a situation that I don't even know of how they would, how they could possibly get through it. They had emergency after emergency after emergency. And by the time they saw us, like the vet, this, this guy, this young guy who saw us, he looked like he was just like a ghost. So I have no idea what kind of horrific situation he had just been through with all of these different pets. But when we said, when he was a profusely apologizing, well, because he's Canadian too, <laughs> about being, <laughs> about waiting, about us waiting, we said, like, no problem. If we had to wait that long, we can't imagine what you have had your days been like. And I think that just, it changed everything with this guy. So I don't know, for the people that are listening, just give your vets grace and and patience um because there's got to be a reason why that happens to you so i don't know i thought and i i I just respect your profession so much doc so i thought you should know i I really appreciate that i mean i and yeah i can tell you you know we kind of sometimes about that uh, um amongst ourselves as as a staff you know looking in in into the vet clinic it doesn't look like there's much happening um you know and that's intentional because we you know we don't want to see the the bad stuff (laughs) um uh, yeah and mm-hmm. you know definitely i, I it, it's tough to, to go from one one situation to another and um i mean the, the clients you know and pet owners like you that that give us that grace and and that say that you know just say those kinds of things just and, and are, are patient um that really just it takes a, a an enormous burden of stress off you know off of our shoulders yeah i just i just thought I, i've been meaning to share that story with you for a while i was gonna actually direct message you it but anyways i'm glad i can say it verbally um kathy you're up and then tracy you're on deck uh and then bird you are in the wings try to we'll try to get to every head kathy. okay first of all stop sending your canadian geese to minnesota because they're on the lake behind my house as a stopover well there's another like 500 of them that they're coming <laughs> okay um Dr. Kenya, my question is, I I have a cat and two dogs, but I'm going to ask this from the point of view of a dog owner. Um, Based on your experience, what are a couple things that we can do to promote the health of our dogs? Um, Anything that we can do instead of, you know, sort of being in the reactive, something's wrong, what on the a flip side of it? What can we do that would really promote their health? Yeah, that's a that's a really good question. Um, I think that probably the biggest thing, and uh, kind of the more most challenging thing, is uh, keeping up with their dental health. Um, and then and that includes, uh, unfortunately, for a lot of dogs, uh, regular dental cleanings. Um, a lot of it does have to do with genetics. Um, you know, a lot of, uh, I do see a lot of owners, um, if they're able to brush their dog's teeth really well, you know, that uh, the teeth look great. They were able to, to go, you know, a lot of, a lot of time between cleanings. Um, and, you know, um, sometimes though you just really can't fight the genetics and, um, actually being able to, to get that tartar off of the teeth, um, off of the gums. I mean, anytime they're eating, they're chewing, you know, playing, um, tugging, uh, there's little micro abrasions that are happening and little tiny capillaries that, uh, you know, are bursting. Um, and those are actually being exposed directly to that, that, uh, bacteria in that tartar down the gums. Uh, and we can actually see that further uh, worse in kidney disease. We can see it worse in heart disease, liver disease. Um, and so that would definitely be one of my my first recommendations. Um, and, and, you know, and especially if, if you know that you have a dog that's um, a dog or a cat that's prone to dental disease, um, you know, because it can can be very expensive, um, you know, talk with your vet, get a get a price quote long before you need to worry about it. Um, you know, see if they have a plan or something like that, you know, that you can do like monthly payments for, um, but definitely don't delay it just, you know, because it's one of those things that you, you probably will never know exactly how many ways it's, it's you know, saved your pet or elongated their life. But um, and one of the biggest, you know, biggest things. Um, and then the second one, and this is kind of a surprising one for me, but um, I think actually just just starting your, your animal and a fish, uh, or sorry, hip and joint supplement or, you know, a, a fish oil or something, um, even, you know, if they're younger, even then, uh, I think that, uh, you know, not only does it preserve the joints and, um, you know, help with joint health when, when they get older and their body doesn't make as much of those uh, molecules anymore, 
um, but it, it uh, helps improve their coat. You know, I see a lot of dandruff and, and dry skin that can worsen allergies. And um, I can't tell you how many times a day I recommend a, a joint supplement um, just to take all of it at once. <laughs> Thank you. That's that's great. Um, my husband does a great job brushing our dog's teeth, both of them. The 11 year old Golden has never had to have any dental care. Oh, I'm and, so jealous. That is incredible. Right. Our veterinarian keeps saying, just keep doing whatever you're doing. But honestly, in puppy class, they taught us to do that. And it makes all the difference. So both of them have great teeth right now. That's Thank incredible. you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Oh, that's super cute. Uh, we have to take Bunsen and teeth clean. We, uh, we brush his teeth. Um, but I think it's about time for his cleaning. So um, that's a good reminder. Okay, we're off to Tracy. Uh, Bird R is on deck. And then Jennifer is in the wings. And then Paula, I see you there. You're after all of that. Thank you for everybody being very patient. Um, go ahead, Tracy. All right. Um, I have a, a question. Um, it's about my cat. Um, so I was just wondering what you recommend for introducing him to a kitten i was thinking about getting like a ginger kitten uh like maybe like a year old like female you know if i could find one or just you know another kitten but um it's 10 and i'd only have like a couple days off from work um a week so i want to know how you recommend going about introducing him to a new cat Sorry about that. My, my kitten in the middle of that knocked the fruit bowl into the dog's water bowl. It was a whole mess. So, yeah. That so, sounds about right. <laughs> um, I mean, uh, you know, uh, uh, kind of splitting up the time, uh, uh, you know, that you spend between the two is going to be important just, you know, so one doesn't get jealous of the other. But um, when, when you have... Uh, um, I'm sorry, my mind just went blank. So what you have, I'm sorry, it's, it's your, your um, cat and then a new kitten. Yeah, I'm, I haven't gotten the kitten yet, but, okay, you know, okay. I was just thinking about in the future for when okay. I got the kitten. Yeah. Yeah. So um, um, I'm making the Michael Scott face, the, the one that I always tweet um, right now. But anyways, um, but so, uh, you know, you, you want to um, uh, keep them separated, uh, especially in the beginning with cats. They, uh, you know, they can intimidate each other and just essentially piss each other off um, just by staring at each other even. Um, and, and staring contests are, are never a good thing between cats. Um, and so, you know, you want to keep them separated by a door uh, or something, you know, some vis uh, physical barrier. Um, and then you can start feeding each of the cats on, on either side of the door so they can start to make a positive association with the other one's smell and, you know, the sounds they make. Um, expect some hissing, you know, expect some growling. Cats have a lot of feelings and they got to feel them all. <laughs> and you know, uh, just kind of take it slowly. Um, there's a, a YouTube channel called Cole and Marmalade. And she's really oh, cute. I <laughs> one's, yeah, one's a ginger kitty and, and then the other one's a, an all black cat. Um, and they, they have a, a good video of, uh, of introducing the two. And, um, you know, it's kind of nice to see, you know, okay, so, you know, Cole is hissing at little kitten marmalade and, and now they love each other. So, um, because it, cause especially in the beginning, I mean, cats can make really just scary, unsettling sounds and it makes you wonder if they'll ever like each other. Um, but, but, you know, just going slowly and, and, and just being consistent, you know, is, is going to be the, the biggest thing. Yeah, because we've had two cats before where, you know, one was acquired well after the other one and they never got along. So I'm hoping to actually break the cycle. And yeah, no, exactly. Have them I mean, be friends. And, and again, you know, know what each cat likes. And especially if, if one, especially if the, the older cat doesn't like the newer one, um, you know, I mean, take a, a lot of, you know, take your pillowcase and, and put it uh, where the new cat sleeps and, and get their scent, you know, a little bit of their scent on it. So the two scents are kind of mixed and, you know, put it somewhere that, that the, um, uh, that your current cat, you know, can choose to lay if they want and, um, you know, be creative, you know, play, play uh, together, let them kind of pot pot each other through the door and stuff. And, and really just, you know, it, do it does take a, you know, some work on your part though, if, if one, uh, not crazy about the concept. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for the question, Tracy. I like that cats have all these feelings and they've got to feel them all. <laughs> That's great. Um, Okay, Bird R, Jennifer, and then uh, after actually Bird R, there's some people have been sending me messages, so we'll let Bird R go, and then uh, we'll, I'll read a message. 
Yeah, hi. I just had a comment coming back to the issue about pay, uh, pay for veterinary professionals. I was one of the, I was actually in the first class of licensed vet techs in New York State back in the 70s. And pay was an issue then, right? I mean, about a third of my class actually went into pharmaceutical research because they couldn't afford to live on what a vet tech made. Oh, and, goodness. you know, it was just, I mean, it was crazy back then. And I, th I think a lot of it stems from, you know, able or aren't willing to pay for, you know, this, what services would really cost if vet professionals made, you know, what they really need to make. Yeah, and I, I think that that's a really good point, um, you know, in, in that at the end of the day, medical care is expensive. Um, I think that there's other contributions, um, especially in the United States, just the just the astronomical cost of health care, um, unfortunately, trickles down into animals. Um, essentially, you know, animal ph uh, pharmaceutical companies charge as much as they do because they can. Um, yep. and, and even just the cost of things like boxes of gloves and, you know, all the, the basic uh, necessities, you know, I, I mean, the, that's that's a, an enormous overhead that we see right now, too. Um, I mean, in you know, in reality, um, vets are, are never going to be paid as much as human doctors. That that's, you know, reasonable, first of all, just because, especially with just how advanced human medicine is at this point, I am in, just every day in awe of what, of what human doctors do. Um, you know, but I, I think too, uh, you know, vets, we need to stop limiting ourselves, you know, as well in that we need to utilize our vet techs. Um, I think that they're, you know, that, that there should be a, um, a veterinary nurse practitioner, um, you know, some kind of uh, licensure or something like that available because there's certainly demand. I mean, I don't, you don't need a DVM to look at in your cytology, which the techs look at anyways, and they tell me what they see. Um, and they know, you know, what I'm going to prescribe as it is. And, you know, a client doesn't need to pay a, a vet price to, to see that, you know, and, and it doesn't need to take a, a slot that another owner, you know, with a sicker pet or whatever could potentially see. Um, and so I, I think that there's a lot of different things that need to change. And, um, but I think too, you know, realistically, we need to also keep in mind that, you know, some of it is limited just by um, financial availability, you know, of owners. And, um, you know, obviously we, we need to make sure that care is accessible. Um, and so it's, it's not that we can just, you know, crank up prices, but I think right now there's a lot of um, sunk costs along the way that, that we're just not addressing, um, you know, and, and I think too, that will, that will um, change as, as we see changes in human medicine for good or for bad. And I'm a big proponent too of pet insurance as well. I mean, I think I have I have a dog that's you know had a lot of issues over her life, and if I hadn't had pet insurance, it would have you know been a real hardship. And and you know, I think that you know, it's, in many cases, it really works out. And I think you know, people don't realize that you know when they go for their own medical care, their insurance is paying a lot of that, and so they they sort of try to you know, equate what they pay at their own physician's office when they go and they pay their $25 copay. And then they go to their vet's office and it's a $300 office visit because of all the things that, you know, you have to pay for at the vet. And they try to equate the two, but they're not really equivalent because insurance is paying so much of their own when, it, when they don't have pet insurance for their own, for their pet. And so it, you know, it's not equivalent. Oh, absolutely. And, and, yeah, absolutely. And I think too, just as hopefully, I mean, I feel like we're, we're seeing a change in that people are, are becoming more aware of the cracks, you know, in, in the medical system. And hopefully as we start to see more people informed, we'll see more people asking, you know, why is it this way? Awesome. Thanks for your question. Um, Dr. Kania, do you have another 20 minutes? We have a lot of people still speaking and we've got a big space. Um, do you have to go right at uh, the top of the uh, hour? No, no, I, I have plenty of time and I'm a long-winded person. So, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay I, yeah, that'd be great. We can, if that's okay, we'll we'll get through everybody who wants to speak. Absolutely. Um, yeah, that's one of the things that is, is so tough with us with this. And it's something that we we sometimes gently try to tell people is that, like they see Bunsen and Beaker and um, people want a dog when they see our dogs, but they maybe have no idea what happens and how expensive it is. If your dog needs healthcare, like if your dog has to go to the vet, 
Um, and, especially and then it's just dogs. like, yeah, and they're big dogs, right? Um, and we're trying, we try to be gentle about that. Like, you need to be their pick insurance or be putting away like hundreds of dollars every month, you know, in a, a rainy day fund. Um, and sometimes, sadly, like, I hope nobody takes us the wrong way, but we get like every week 10 GoFundMes that people want us to share. Um, and then I, I'm not even like at the level that Matt from We Rate Dogs is, but we have to pick one to share and then verify it. And it's, and you know, like that's, if you have a pet, it's very, very expensive. And I think that the previous person made a good point that you have to make a plan, pet insurance or put the money away because your services are exceptional and they're not free. (laughs) Just like healthcare is for you as a person. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. That was a, I, I took up some of our time there. Um, <laughs> uh, Jennifer, go ahead. And then Paula. Oh, okay. Well, Je- I'm sorry, Jennifer, go ahead. And then I'll read one of the messages. Jennifer, go ahead. Okay. Um, so Dr. Jessica, I wanted to also thank you as a vet. I will never forget the day that I was asking my vet a zillion questions. I think we'd had something removed off of one of our big dogs and I apologized. Just, I'm so sorry. I feel like I'm, I'm just, it's going crazy. And he said, no, we like people like you because you bring your animals in for well visits and see them when they're happy and okay. And I thought maybe that's an aspect of, um, the problem, not only with, with money, but also with the mental health of the professionals that if we can, as a society, normalize going in for well checks for our pets, um, that it might help. Yeah. But my, my real question was, um, Jim Henson up at veterinary hospital, which one do you like the best? <laughs> uh, I would say the Muppets veterinary hospital, but I'm pretty sure their license is expired. <laughs> That makes sense. I'm pretty sure James Harriet's license is also expired. Thank yeah. You. <laughs> no, and, and I mean, and, and absolutely oh. about um, seeing happy visits and, um, you know, it's, it's kind of a running joke at every clinic I'm at. I get these giant tubs of just freeze-dried liver treats because they're like the grossest smelling and best tasting, apparently, um, treats you can find. And uh, you know, I, I just find that the dogs like them over the treats that the clinics get. And uh, it, it's just nice because, you know, the dogs that are kind of, uh, you know, uncertain, um, it's so great to see the change in the owner when when the dog, you know, discovers, oh, there's a treat here. Okay, I guess they're not trying to poison me. I think I'll eat it. Um, discovers that they they like it and they start wagging their tail. Um, yeah, I mean, and, and it's it's definitely, you know, because it does, you know, it is it is just difficult if, if um you know, you wait on an issue like a heart murmur or something that you might not necessarily see or hear, or, you know, there might not be any signs outwardly, um, and, until a lot of things go wrong and, and, you know, and then it's, it's, it's tough. You got to make a lot of tough decisions in a short amount of time. And the worst part is you probably don't know the veterinarian very well either. And, you know, you're trusting this person you don't, don't know very well to, to kind of guide you through this, you know, really emotional process. Which is completely different. Um, my Frodo is turning 11 this year and he was diagnosed with a heart murmur, um, but it was at a well check visit. And so we're mm-hmm. in so much of a better place. <laughs> no, exactly. I mean, and, and, you know, and, and I love the owners that ask questions and, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's just, it's good. And, and it's good too, because it makes me as a vet feel secure knowing that if, if I overlook something, you're going to know it. And, you know, and, and, it, and I don't mean that in a diminutive way, um, you know, but, but you're going to know and you're going to be able to help me fill in that blank. Because at the end of the day, you know, we're a team. It's, it's not like the vet and everyone else. I mean, it's the pet owner, the pet and the veterinarian, the vet tech, you know, everybody else, you know, everybody there. Um, and, you know, and again, I, I, it makes me at the end of the day sleep a lot better knowing, hey, this owner is involved. They know what's going on and they're going to make sure I'm accountable, too. Thanks. What a fun and great question, Jennifer. Thank you. I shared a picture, hope you don't mind, of Frodo up to the top of the nest there. Frodo kind of wants everyone to know it's just too hot. Yes, we had freezy blankets in the summer for that. 
Um, funny you mentioned about uh, the the dog getting a treat and then um, <laughs> thinking the vet's okay. That's that's Beaker. Um, she got her shots and then um, got a treat from the vet and then was like following the vet back to like the cooler where all the shots are kept. And she's like, hey, got any more shots back there? <laughs> like, what do you got back there? I want some more shots. We, I always tell owners, you know, we're, we're not above bribery. You know, we start small, but if we have to break out the spray cheese, you know, that's all right. I mean, it doesn't count if they're at the vet. <laughs> yeah, that's like Bunsen. He's a little bit more wary than Beaker just did. Yeah, care. sometimes they learn that it's <laughs> okay, not. So I have to they leave. learn it's not free, but, you know, we try, we do our best. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I have to read a couple. I have to read a couple, uh, at least one one of the direct messages, and then we'll get to Paula. Um, this is from Sherry Joy. Recently, took my dog to the vet for a skin rash and was told she had a bacterial infection on her skin. She's on antibiotics for several weeks. What what could maybe cause a uh, bacterial infection on her skin? Yeah, so that's something I see a lot, and especially here. Um, so one of the the most common spiels I have is my allergy spiel. <laughs> um, a lot of dogs are, are affected in some way, shape, or form by uh, usually environmental allergies, um, and so we can see that manifest in in ways uh, such as rashes on the belly. Um, we can see uh, itchy paws, so they might lick their paws or chew at their paws. Um, no, dogs do not clean their paws. It's not normal for your dog to, to lick at their paws for you know for a few minutes. Um, uh, or chew at them. We might see ear infections or red ears, you know, that are kind of recurring or kind of wax and wane, um, you know, red eyes or kind of attacks of reverse sneezing. Um, and so definitely, uh, especially this time of year, uh, I think there are, there are some plants that it just as they pollinate um, and, and the dogs are hanging out on, at least if they're like spalding, they're hanging out on, on the grass and, you know, they're sleeping there. Uh, if they don't have a lot of uh, fur on the belly or even if they do, they can get a rash there. And, um, you know, dogs are, they're not clean in general. Um, and, and, you know, we can see an infection uh, set up shop pretty quickly after, you know, even just a couple hours or so of, of them itching. Um, so it's it's likely a, a larger, you know, issue at play. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, if maybe in the future you notice some symptoms of allergies. Okay. Uh, so Sherry, uh, if, hopefully that answered your question through direct message. Uh, Paula, we'll go to you. And then there's another direct message that I have to get to. So go ahead, Paula. Okay. Hi, Dr. Kena. How are you? And thank you for taking my question. Um, my end's kind of crazy. I think when Jason said you have to save for your rainy day, well, my rainy days are raining and pouring because I have two diabetic Brussels Griffons and one of them also has Cushing's and we're going through a real gamut, but I'm kind of um, wondering what you feel um, about the dog food industry. Um, sometimes these dog foods, I think, I don't know if they help or not help their situation with the health because I don't know. Um, I know homegrown diets are really hard, but then you see all these designer dog foods that are grain free and then that can lead to cardiomyopathy. And you're wondering, like, you don't know what direction to go in. And it's like, I've done a lot with my dogs. I've had dogs that are, that had uh, kidney a lot of dedication to do that. So I was kind of wondering what you felt about the dog food industry. And, and, and do you think that that kind of, can hinder sometimes the health of your dog. You're trying to do the best and feed them the best, but it's just like, it's just not making it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and, and, you know, definitely that is, that's, and it's definitely a hot button issue too. I mean, I feel in general, it's, I mean, sadly, and I kind of hate to say it this way, I do regard a lot of the prescription dogs um, in the way that I regard other pharmaceuticals. And part of that, uh, you know, and, and I know that you're not just, you know, talking about prescription foods and uh, you're talking about foods in general, but, you know, I'm just going to start there. Um, but I mean, part of that, if these companies are going to market them as prescriptions, then they're going to be held, at least in my mind, to the same standard as the prescriptions, you know, that I, that I prescribe. Um, but I think, too, that it's, it's difficult. They're... I feel like the more I learn about pet food labeling and, um, and I had, a, I, I really feel that I had a good, uh, nutrition professor in, in vet school, a good, uh, small, small animal nutrition professor. Um, he did represent Hill's company. Um, and you know, he was very open about that and, you know, kind of discussed some of the differences between, you know, like research and, and everything at that time. And that changes so fast. That was gosh, 10 years ago. So it probably doesn't even, uh, it's probably not even the same anymore, but, um, yeah. And so, I, I mean, I, I feel like it's, it's almost a job in and of itself, kind of 
untangling the the ways that you know you can hide things and and you know or or the ways that people are being advertised to um i think one of probably the greatest advertising luxury is this whole concept that um dogs and and cats need to eat chicken breast as the first ingredient um you know chicken i mean to us that looks great cuz i like chicken breast you know um but you know for for dogs and cats i mean it's one of the least nutritious parts of the body it's uh, kind of the junk food for them and you know it tastes pretty good but it it really isn't isn't much to it um you know but but then it's like I mean, if I'm watching commercials or if I'm seeing a YouTube ad or, you know, even walking down the aisle at PetSmart, I'm seeing these bags of food that are beautifully colored and they have blueberries and avocados and all this crap that I should probably be eating. And, you know, that's the kind of stuff that that if I was a consumer and I was a pet owner, I would say, wow, that looks like they care a lot more, you know, about their ingredients than this other company. Um, But I mean, I I think at the end of the day, in reality, at least in the United States, that's the way that. Um, meat is slaughtered and transported. I, I really think that there are not a lot of different sources uh, for you know for different meats at the end of the day. Um, I mean, I, I think I think there's definitely an argument to be made about the you know the companies themselves and, and companies um, uh, that research for pet food. Uh, I think there's an argument to be made about uh, strides that they've been making in, in the last you know decade or so. Um, and I think to you know, that, uh, as you mentioned with the grain free and then the cardiomyopathy, um, I think that that, at least in my mind is more of just a fascinating, like, you know, rather than vets saying, I told you so it should be, Hey, why that's fascinating. There's something there about, you know, like why do dogs, or at least do dogs do better with grain in their food. And, you know, I think that that'll, that could open up a lot of questions just again, coming from a one health state, but, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think that it's something that, needs more scrutiny, needs more regulation. And, and I, I don't really know the answer at this point. Um, I, you know, I know it's pretty loaded because every vet has kind of different, um, you know, opinions about it, but it, it can be very confusing. And, um, you know, you're trying to, you know, I respect my vet and we, we do have a great re- relationship and, um, but, you know, I've seen things beneficial from, you know, trying a homegrown diet. Like I said, when I had dogs and we did certain things and then my vet was asking me, what are you doing? So, but it's, it's hard because like yeah. I said, you get all these things coming at you and it's just, I think there's got to be more regulations with dog foods. I think just all the, like you said, the crap that's out there, it, it can get so inundating and, and confusing to the consumer because you're trying to give your dog or cat the best thing available and it's actually not. <laughs> so, but exactly. I think, exactly. Yeah. But thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Yeah, no, thank, thank you. I mean, that's an yeah, again, that's a very it's important a loaded question. I know. No, but and again, and that's the kind of thing you know you're you're you know ask your vet about because because you have an answer or they should at least uh, be able to have that conversation with you and so never be you know never be afraid to ask questions like that. No, I'm not, but I I you know again, thank you so much. I really really appreciate it. Uh, there's a <laughs> speaking of grain free diets, um, I. I don't. I don't think. I, I don't think I can call him a friend, but uh, we're friendly. His name's Timothy Caulfield. He's a science communicator in, and uh, he's a law professor at the University of Alberta. He tweeted out about uh, like how a grain-free diet, like it was some study that it didn't actually the animal's health. And boy, did he step in it. Um, normally he gets. Oh, no. Yeah, normally he gets a lot of like angry people from um, because he's you know trying to debunk stuff. He's a debunker, right? He's probably one of the most well-known debunkers in Canada. And boy, he didn't know what he stepped in when he was talking about that. Well, he knew like he was just retweeting a study um, and it was like a whole to do. And I talked about it on the podcast because they looked at these different grain free diets and there's some wacky bananas type stuff in the these grain free diets for these dogs. Like you said, like blueberries and um, avocado and just like, wow. No wonder it's more money kind of thing. <laughs> well, I think, too, it doesn't address the underlying issue. Um, you know, going back to the, the belly rash and allergies in general, um, I, I feel like in the last five years or so, we've seen an enormous uptick in, in dogs that have allergies. And I really do wonder if what if, if we were to stop breeding any dog that started having skin allergies, uh, you know, before the age of six or something. Um, and, and I wonder if that's more the solution 
you know, then, then uh, looking at new diets or getting crazy new ingredients and novel protein, hydrolyzed protein, you know, all these expensive prescription foods. And, um, you know, and, and I just want to plug real, there is this great website called balanceit.com. Um, just, you know, one word balance it. Uh, and basically you can input uh, ingredients into the, the website and, you know, it'll kind of spit back different amounts. Um, uh, you know, obviously it can't be a um, perfect uh, balance, you know, calculator for any dog food, but um, if you are going to go a uh, home home diet route, um, I would definitely take a, a look at that website and, you know, it, it kind of gives you a good baseline to start with. Okay, thanks, Doc. Um, I have a question from direct message, and it's kind of a serious and sad one, uh, if you're okay with that. Yep, yep, go ahead. So the question is from Michael. Um, is it ethical to euthanize an older dog that has canine cognitive dysfunction, but they're not they're not in pain. Um, and I guess like the, the main question this person wants is like, how can you ever decide when it's time? It's that, that really tough question. I don't know if you can help with that. Yeah. And that's a, that's a situation I, I really do see often, um, you know, where their body is still good, you know, they got some arthritis, maybe some cataracts, but I mean, their but their, their mind is just not there. Um, and, and I've, I've seen situations where, you know, again, the dog was, was otherwise healthy, but their cognitive dysfunction, um, and kind of going back, canine cognitive dysfunction is essentially, um, uh, doggy Alzheimer's is, is kind of the colloquial term for it. Um, and I, I, you know, it's, um, very similar symptoms. It's a very some basically the exact same disease process. Um, we we start to see uh, confusion. We can see anxiety, especially related to circadian rhythms that can get worse at nighttime. Um, we can see things like urinating in the house. They can start to wander or vocalize at night. Um, and I think that for me, at least, some of the more, more heartbreaking cases are when the dog is is starting to become aggressive towards certain family members, um, and especially certain family members that were, you know, originally just th their best buddy. Um, and and you know, I I mean, I tell pet owners, um, when it comes to euthanasia, there there are a lot of right times. You're not going to pick the wrong one. When it comes to things like uh, cognitive dysfunction or um, but, you know, uh, th things that are, are affecting the animal where they're otherwise healthy and, and happy and not in pain or suffering. Um, you know, part of euthanasia is considering the quality of life of both the pet and the owner. Um, and part of that quality involves your bond. And, and when I start to see bonds between the pets and the owners break down, that's, you know, that's where we're, it's my job to start to step in and say, hey, we got to start thinking about, you know, saying goodbye and um, you know, I, I think that a lot of people will feel selfish for, you know, thinking, oh, I, I you know, I want to say goodbye to my pet. I want to euthanize them, you know, quote unquote, just because they have cause function. And I mean, it, it is until you've gone through it, I don't think that you can really appreciate the seriousness of it. I mean, you know, cats and dogs just yowling all night, you know, walking from room to room. I mean, I, I can't even imagine watching my animal go through that. Um, and, and, you know, and so I, it, it's, it's, it's an act of compassion, not just for, for, you know, you in, in that you'll know that they're not suffering and you'll be at peace in that way, but they are suffering, you know, they, they are, they're trapped in, in a mind that's not their own anymore. And, you know, they, they can't express, they can, they can't have the same life that they had, you know, they're, they're not experiencing the world the way that they used to. And, you know, they may seem happy and, and, you know, um, I, I know that there, there are definitely cases where, where they are just happy and blissful and, you know, whatever. But I mean, I think at the end of the day, there is there is suffering there, you know, and just because it's not physical doesn't mean it's any, you know, any less suffering. Well, well, thank you for answering it that that way. That's such a wise answer. Oof, it's such a heavy, heavy topic. <laughs> it is. It is. I mean, and, and just I guess that. I'm sure it brings back emotions for people when they've had to say goodbye to their pet. Um, but having Absolutely. having somebody like you guide us through it, boy, it makes it way easier. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that means okay, one more uh, one more message. This uh, this one is very lighthearted, sort of. <laughs> um, this is from Ray. Uh, could you ask Dr. Jessica how bad it is that my Bernice Mountain Dog eats acorns? Also, how do I stop her from eating acorns? <laughs> so. This is a great question. It's reminiscent of uh, the end of Emperor's New Groove. 
did you steal my acorn? Um, no. Uh, uh, so actually, uh, as funny as it is, we can sometimes see with acorns uh, a type of toxicity. Uh, acorns do contain tannins. Um, off the top of my head, I would have to look up the amount they'd have to eat to cause the toxicity. Uh, we do also see it with um, with oak leaves, um, you know, as they drop and as they turn brown. Um, the chemical change, uh, turning the leaf from green to brown, uh, is caused by a chemical t- called tannin or tannins. It's a group of, of compounds. Um, it's also what gives tea its dark fl- uh, dark color. Um, but we we can we can see in in high amounts it can be toxic. Um, it can also you know cause GI uh, upset, vomiting, diarrhea. I'm sure uh, that you're used to uh, seeing that it's in some some capacity. Um, as far as preventing from eating them, that's a tough one. Um, you know I uh, um, I, I really gosh I mean other save some kind of net or hiring a team of squirrels perhaps to to forage the ground for you. I, I'm really not sure, but I, you know, I think that you should look into the squirrels though, because I got a couple near me that I think need some employment opportunities. Yeah, that's a tough one. Um, Bunsen doesn't eat acorns, but he does find um, delicious treasures left by other wild animals on the walk. And it's absolutely disgusting and we can't get him to stop doing it because by the time we get close enough, it's kind of gone. So it's just kind of a thing he does occasionally. <laughs> um, but also there's some danger with that, right? There could be parasites and whatnot. So uh, This is true. This is very gosh. true. And, you know, it's just, I, I feel like just roll with it because, gosh, it's, they're, they're going to find a way to hurt themselves no matter what, right? So. <laughs> okay, we have one final speaker. Um, I, I don't know how to say your your handle. Ispertuti, Ispertuti. Um, I don't recognize your account. I sent you a direct. Did you reply to it before I give you speaking privileges? Oh yeah, Chris is texting me. I think Chris is in this thing too. My wife, Chris, she's like Bunsen rolls in it too. Yes, yes, he does, Chris. <laughs> it's pretty gross. Um, before we wrap up, uh, oh, so he's getting the person's getting back to me. Uh, before we wrap up, are there any more questions that you have for uh, Doctor Kanya? Um, you can direct message me or ask to speak. We're a little bit over time, but she's been super gracious. Um, very, very gracious worth of time. Yes. I was waiting for. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh yeah, you can go ahead. Um, I believe um, uh, Espiritu is one of my mutuals um, or somebody that I know, so I'm pretty sure that it's legit. Hey, Doctor Kanya. Yes, I don't have a um, a, how should you say? a real uh twitter account for my actual uh person but then i saw this and i was like hey how, how's how's your day been and i saw it was kind of tough <laughs> and how's louise <laughs> oh, no, i appreciate that um yeah no my uh for, for those of you who didn't see my timeline i spayed my uh one of my kittens today uh louise and so she um did really well i was actually kind of nervous about spaying her because i haven't done a big surgery like that for for one of my own animals but um she did great and and i don't know where she went she was um pretty stoned when she got home and and uh she's got the cone on and was kind of grieving her life so i think she's somewhere just hating me but she's doing well (laughs) and mr b he is uh, sort of slid onto uh, my arm and so i'm trapped i can't reach my lacroix somebody send help you know again i just in general i appreciate that you know, this Twitter account is able to, to reach people near and far. And, you know, I mean, people, you know, kind of spread the word about vet med and then just spread the word about, um, you know, the, the struggles that we all kind of go through in medicine in general. And so I really appreciate that. Uh, thanks. And that was all. <laughs> Bye. Thanks, Esper Tutti. I Now that I know how to pronounce that, I was like trying to phonetically figure that out. I'm very bad at pronouncing things. Um, Chris makes fun of me all the time. I always garble up words. Um, <laughs> when Beaker got spayed, it absolutely didn't affect her. Nothing. Like, we had to be careful. We had to keep her from like tackling Bunsen the second she got home. Good grief. She was like it, un- unaffected. It is so hard to keep a straight face on the phone when I'm telling owners to, you know, I'm doing my post discharge or post surgery spiel. Like, okay, keep them, 
you know, calm for the next few days. <laughs> and they're just trying to keep a straight face too. They're like, oh my gosh, this bitch is crazy. Like, I, I get it. I mean, I think Mr. B, he didn't even, gosh, he didn't miss a beat. I mean, I, yeah. And <laughs> Louise, she was at least a little confused, but, but yeah, it, it's impressive how fast they, they bounce back. And, you know, I was worried she was going to be in pain and she's rolling around and trying to fight with Mr. B. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Beaker was on the couch like WWE jumping on Bunsen. Like, oh, yeah. Like, Rachi, that's like what she used to do when she was younger. Like, Macho Man Randy Savage off the top ropes. Okay, sorry. Ra uh, Ramona, go ahead. You'll be your last speaker today. No problem. Just a fast question for you. How can we help you? Um, I always feel bad when I know my vet's having a bad day and when Jason was talking about, you know, having to wait an hour and a half, their world must have just blown up. Is there something that we can do to be supportive? What what can we drop off? I always wonder, you know, would they like food? Would they like flowers? Would they like, you know, a grub hub certificate? What can we do to show more support for our vets? I mean, that that's a, a really good question. Um, I mean, I honestly, just even just saying it, you know, just saying like, Hey, we appreciate you. It means a lot. I mean, you would be very surprised. Um, just, you know, a genuine thank you. And, and again, especially a genuine thank you to the Paris staff, the people who, who you don't really see. Um, you know, I, I mean, and I think, gosh, I mean, I, I feel like I've been looking at so many, so much of the big picture concerns, you know, the, the pay disparity, the, um, you know, work life balance, et cetera. And, and, I mean, just even on the small, you know, the small uh, uh, terms, I, I have an entire shoebox that that I keep um, with just cards and notes and stuff that owners have written me. I mean, I have um, one one woman um, uh, wrote me. I actually I kind of felt like I was intruding. Uh, we had talked about, uh, I believe it was a similar situation where it was a cognitive dysfunction um, with her pet, and she just could was not ready to let let this pet go. Um, and so uh, I put a, just a, a note in, you know, my reminder work list thing to, um, uh, to, to call her in about a week and kind of check in how they're doing. Um, and, and I, I think I ended up leaving a message and I, you know, kind of just felt like, I, uh, you know, I'm kind of intruding. She's probably like, who is this vet? Um, and then to my surprise, she ended up uh, coming in soon, uh, you know, soon after and, and we euthanized uh, the pet. Um, and she wrote me a, a card, you know, just saying like, Hey, it, it uh, you know, felt like you were just kind of reaching out and saying, like, you're, you know, you're not alone in this. Um, I mean, I like I can't explain the emotion it's, it's even bringing up in me now. Um, just knowing, you know, that a phone call that even in the moment I, I was like, should I even, you know, bother calling? Like, I don't think she really wants to to hear from me. Um, you know, and and I, just little things like that, just at least for me, make make an enormous difference and and remind me that it's not just, you know, some you know, random, uh, you know, uh, I don't even know how to explain it. I, I guess it, it reminds me that it's not just a big, you know, pile of despair. Like there, there are so many real people and, and these experiences that, 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 you know, some of the toughest ones of your lives. And, and I mean, I can't believe that, you know, the, the honor that I feel that, that people allow us to, to be there for that. And, you know, when, when people express that, it really makes makes a difference, at least for me. Great. Thanks for that answer. And that's a good good thought. I Just a thank you card probably would be a great thing to do every now and then. Thanks for the question and for us to think about that. Um, Dr. Kanye, thank you so much for being our guest tonight. Yeah, you, rep, you represent the option that guards the, the health of these creatures that we love so much. And it was just my honor to have you tonight to talk. Um, thank you so much. Thank you um, for, for inviting me on. Thank you, everybody, for coming. I uh, never never thought that this many people would care about <laughs> um, a, a silly vet account. So, you know, again, I just the, the community here means so much to me. And just the fact that so many people care, it really you know, reminds you that it is so much bigger than, than just your clinic and, and your, you know, the, the animal in front of you. It, it's so much bigger than that. So just thank you all. And thank you Bunsen and, and, and Beaker um, for, you know, giving me a form. My pleasure. Anytime.